Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England. Our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. And whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. These podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them, but also tell us what you think. These are debates we all need to be part of. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. My guest today is Dr. Robin Russell-Jones, author of The Gilgamesh Gene Revisited, the revised version of his original work, The Gilgamesh Gene, published in 2017. Now, whilst Robin is one of the UK's top environmental campaigners, He originally trained as a medical doctor, where he became a dermatologist with a special interest in skin cancer. He ran the UK's top skin cancer unit at the Institute of Dermatology for many years, and during that time, he published over 200 peer-reviewed papers. Today, he runs his own part-time medical practice, and which this gives him more time for what is effectively his second career as an environmental campaigner. In that, he's been highly active since the 1980s, where he spearheaded the successful campaign to have lead removed from petrol, when it had been shown to be poisoning people around the world. Now in this talk, we get into how he came to write The Gilgamesh Gene and the background to it. So Robin, what's the book about? Uh, Well, it's really an attempt to explain why uh, we have adopted a destructive approach to the environment which sustains all life on the planet. Um, Over the last few millennia, we have gone from a group of people that lives in harmony with nature to a hugely increased population of people that is doing immense damage to nature. Um, And I just wanted to try and analyse the the sort of mental approach that has uh, brought us to the point that we have reached today, which is that we're faced with the collapse of ecosystems which sustain life on this planet. And we understand exactly what we're doing. We have the scientific expertise to know what's going on, but we don't seem to have the mental capacity to change the way that we do things or to pull us back from the brink of environmental catastrophe, particularly in relation to climate change and loss of um, lots of species. So the book really is an attempt to analyze the human condition and in 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 that sense i sort of take the oldest recorded story in human existence which is the epic of gilgamesh and i use that as a sort of blueprint for the way that mankind has approached the environment which basically gilgamesh was a king who lived in uh, ancient mesopotamia and the epic was first written down as poems in about 2100 bc So Gilgamesh was supposed to have lived 2700 BC. So we're going back almost five millennia uh, to the the events that led to the Epic of Gilgamesh. And um, what he did was he wanted to glorify his name by building palaces and getting people to admire his great accomplishments. And to do that, he needed uh, wood. And he went to the cedar forests in northern sort of Syria, uh, which were guarded by a um, creature that had been put there by the gods. And his job was to guard the cedar forest. And Gilgamesh goes with his friend Enkaidu, and they slay Humbaba. They cut down the cedar trees. They make a log of cedar wood, and they sail down the Euphrates with the head of Humbaba on the front of the raft. So this is the sort of first example in recorded human history of humans plundering a natural resource. Not only that, they kill the guardian that's been ordained by the gods to guard the cedar forest, and then they cut his head off and they sail back down the Euphrates, a sort of triumphant trophy hunter. So you've you've sort of got all the elements of what we're doing to our environment in that one story. We're exploiting nature, we're cutting down the forests, and we're very proud of ourselves for doing it. And anybody who stands in our way gets their head chopped off. (laughs) 
So I thought it was a wonderful sort of point in which to start the human trajectory that's brought us to our current impasse. Brilliant. So how on earth did you get involved with this topic? Well, I've been involved in the environment for uh, over 40 years. So back in the early 80s, I chaired an organisation called CLEAR, Campaign for Lead Free Air. So we were the organisation in this country that uh, got lead out of petrol. Um, uh, And uh, interestingly, after the UK accepted the case for lead free petrol, the whole of Europe went lead free. um, And eventually the whole world went lead free. So about four months ago, the UN announced that the last country in the world had stopped using leaded petrol. So although nowadays we worry about air pollution from diesel and particulates, you know, 40 years ago, the main poison in petrol was lead. It affected children's intelligence, it reduced their, it affected their behaviour, and it was an unnecessary additive. And um, the campaign to get lead out of petrol was successful within two years of it being launched. Uh, it's often looked back at on as the sort of uh, model for how to run an environmental campaign. Um, and after I got involved with the lead campaign, after that was successful, of course, it opened the door to introduce catalytic converters on motor cars because you can't use catalysts with lead because the lead poisons the catalyst in the same way as it poisons children. Uh, so once we got lead out of petrol, we then persuaded the UK government to introduce catalytic converters onto petrol-driven vehicles. Um, and then after that, I became the uh, pollution. I, I chaired the Pollution Advisory Committee at Friends of the Earth in the 80s, and we campaigned very hard on radiation, ionising radiation, radiation discharges, um, and we managed to persuade the authorities that set radiation standards in this country, the National Radiological Protection Board, we persuaded them to revise their standards. Uh, And they then uh, took that internationally and the International Commission for Radiological Protection also revised their radiation standards. So basically the public and workers were not allowed to be exposed to as much radiation as they had been previously. So that was a major achievement. And then the final thing I did in the 80s was to work on ozone depletion. Uh, We had a big conference at the Royal Institute of British Architects in 1988 uh, with speakers from all over the world. And then, of course, the following year, the um, Montreal Protocol was uh, devised by the UN and uh, a ban on CFCs and other ozone depleting substances were introduced internationally. So the two most successful sort of environmental issues, if you like, of the 80s were lead in petrol and ozone depletion. And I was sort of intimately involved with with both of those campaigns. And I produced books. I produced three books in the 80s, one on lead, one on ozone depletion and one on radiation standards. So I did 10 years of campaigning. And then um, after that, I sort of felt I'd made a big contribution and I decided I needed to concentrate on other things. Interestingly, the conference on ozone depletion back in 88 had a session on climate change or global warming as we called it in those days. So we were very aware back in 88 that the chemicals that they were gonna use to substitute for the chemicals that depleted ozone were actually powerful greenhouse gases. And we warned the government. I actually wrote an editorial about it in The Lancet in uh, April of 89, saying that if we are going to phase out CFCs and other ozone depleting chemicals, then just make sure you don't jump from the frying pan into the fire by substituting the CFCs with HCFCs and HFCs, which are actually powerful greenhouse gases. But that's unfortunately what they did. Uh, So it took another almost uh, 30 years before CF, uh, HCFCs and HFCs were, uh, an agreement was reached to phase them out. Um, so anyway, those, those were the issues that I was involved with in the, in the 80s. And uh, actually every campaign I got involved with had a successful outcome. 
And then in about 2011, I felt that um, the climate change debate was going really badly. Uh, I felt that the uh, there was a lot of fake news around. There's a lot of disinformation. There were organisations that were specifically set up to sort of corrupt the public debate and spread disinformation about climate change. Because the, the science about climate change was pretty clear from the start. I mean, you can go back and read, you know, articles that were written 30 years ago about climate change, and they're not very different from what's being written today. So the science was always there. We always knew it was going to be a problem. I mean, some of the science had to be refined and modified, but not much. But of course, there were all these think tanks, uh, basically free market right wing think tanks that were sort of intrinsically or instinctively opposed to any sort of controls on business that might reduce their profits. And of course, climate change does imply that business has to do things differently. And free marketeers didn't like that. And therefore, they set up a series of think tanks, uh, mainly in America, but also uh, one or two in this country, notably the uh, Global Warming Policy Foundation. And um, I felt that there ought to be an organisation that was countering what these people were doing on the scientific side. So in 2011, I set up an organisation, a charity called Help Rescue the Planet. And that our main purpose was to counter the disinformation coming from these think tanks. Uh, secondly, to uh, try and stop uh, fracking being developed in the UK. And thirdly, to try and do something about uh, air pollution, particularly from diesel vehicles. So for 10 years, I sort of campaigned on those three issues. And um, fracking, there's no moratorium on fracking in, in the UK. It's been stopped. Um, they haven't really solved the air pollution issue, but in London, the mayor has done incredible advances based on the need to improve public health and exposure to particulates. And of course, the government has announced that they're phasing out diesel and petrol driven vehicles, new ones from, from 2030. So in a way, those sort of um, the ambition that I set for the Help Rescue the Planet have also been been achieved. So the one thing, of course, that has not been achieved is, is uh, solving climate change, which is a, a massive problem. And, the, and the, you, so you were writing the book after you set up the, the latest um, charity then. So it must have, when did you start writing the book? Well, in about 2016, I sort of felt that I'd learned enough about what was going on and had experienced enough resistance to, um, to what needed to be done to solve climate change. And I also felt there was a lot of indifference from the media. So I felt that a lot of the um, major news organisations in this country had been taken in by the climate change denial camp. I felt the BBC, for example, were giving far too much airtime to the Global Warming Policy Foundation. I mean, the guy who founded it, Nigel Lawson, was invited onto the Today programme and onto Question Time, where he was basically putting out information that was scientifically nonsense. I mean, it was, it was absurd what he was trying to claim. And I felt the BBC weren't being sufficiently critical in their analysis. They were sort of so obsessed with the idea of presenting balance they have this idea that if there's you know a controversial issue you have to give equal weight to both sides even though all the science and all the evidence is on one side so to my mind it was a bit like you know the scientists are saying two and two makes four and then the global the climate change deniers were saying no no two and two makes six so the bbc decided the answer must be five because that's what a balanced view would give you but of course, it's not. The answer isn't five. The answer is four. And the BBC should have been a lot more, a, be a lot better informed about the science of climate change. And they should not have given so much credence to these climate change deniers. Of course, the situation has changed now. I mean, you know, 10 years after I launched Help Rescue the Planet, it is now widely accepted that the science is beyond dispute and that 
climate change is happening, it's man-made, it's serious and it's getting worse. And if we don't do something about it, it will soon become irreversible. Well, I mean, and so you had um, Boris Johnson say that all climate change was man-made at the, at the COP26, is that right? Yeah, I mean, the government is no longer arguing about the reality of the science. Um, but I mean, you know, the science was there 30 years ago. If you read some of the speeches that Margaret Thatcher gave about global warming, I mean, they were spot on. It's very interesting that our best chance of actually tackling climate change in an effective way was round about 89, 90, when mm. Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. I mean, remember, she was a scientist before she was a politician. She had a chemistry degree from Oxford University. So when we pre- went to her with you know, a scientific argument, whether it be lead in petrol or, or um, catalytic converters or ozone depletion, she got it pretty quickly because she had a scientific mind. She was able to analyse it for herself. She didn't have to rely on what civil servants were briefing her. She made up her own mind, that woman. And, of course, she got very involved with both ozone depletion and climate change. And uh, she made some uh, pretty uh, remarkable speeches at the time. They were very far-sighted. And uh, had she stayed in power, I think she was one of the few world leaders that could have persuaded you know, governments at that time to take sensible precautions to stop climate change getting worse. But unfortunately, she was kicked out over Europe. And um, and then the Ameri- the US decided it was too difficult to do anything about climate change at that time. And what then happened was that the oil companies funded all these right-wing think tanks to start spreading disinformation. So all the way through the 90s and the noughties, we had a sort of stream of disinformation emanating from think tanks that were secretly funded by, um, uh, by the fossil fuel industry. So there was a sort of conspiracy of disinformation, exactly the same way there was over you know, tobacco with the, uh, with the manufacturers of cigarettes. But of course, the, the, the climate change is bigger than anything else because it affects every single aspect of our lives and it affects every country in the world. And uh, it doesn't just affect people who choose to smoke cigarettes. No, Um, because I I, I actually, uh, from a, well, I mean, when I look at the, you know, well, actually in in your book, there's some of the stuff on on ancient history and how, how natural climate change has affected our evolution as a species and, you talk about was it um, about 4,000, 3,900 BC or 3,900 years ago of people having to move and, and settle in in other areas because of, of changes in, in rainfall and temperature change in Africa. And um, I don't know yeah, how everything. Event about 3,900 3, BC, the 5.9 kilo year event where uh, due to a sort of natural climate cycle, uh, rainfall reduced quite markedly in the sort of Middle East and, uh, and Northern Africa. So yeah. the tribes that have been living on the uplands in, uh, in Northern Africa and also uh, around the Fertile Crescent had to concentrate around the river valleys in order to, um, uh, in order to sort of uh, be able to sort of water their crops and water their animals. Uh, And that, of course, was the the sort of event, if you like, that sort of seed or provided the seeds for civilization, because the two major civilizations arising at that time arose around the Tigris Euphrates uh, basin and also around the Nile. So, So that was a natural event that precipitated the development of civilization and concentrated resources in a particular geographical place. But of course, what we're doing to the, that was just a local climatic event. This wasn't a sort of, this wasn't a a global climatic event. It was just an event that that affected that area of the world. I mean, the thing about climate change is it's it's global. Uh, There's nowhere that's not going to be affected. Uh, And it's happening a hundred times quicker than the natural warming of the planet that's been going on since the last, uh, end of the last ice age. Right. It's the speed of the 
it's the speed of the process that makes it so difficult to adapt. I mean, previously, you know, um, temperatures would have been going up by, you know, um, less than a, a degree every millennium. You know what I mean? Whereas now they're going up by sort of uh, two to three degrees a century. So the speed of the change is what is so difficult uh, and damaging. And eventually, of course, if enough, uh, if enough positive feedback systems kick in, uh, then, of course, it'll start to gather a momentum of its own. And it doesn't matter what we do, climate change, we won't be able to affect what happens to the climate. So, I mean, already we have um, a major positive feedback uh, event in the uh, in the Arctic with the melting of the sea ice. So instead of the, um, instead of the energy being reflected back off the ice, it is absorbed uh, into the ocean. So the biggest temperature rises are being observed in the, in the Arctic. Um, the world uh, globally, we warmed up by about 1 1.2, 1 1.1 to 1 1.2 centigrade since the uh, 1850 baseline. Um, over land, though, it's higher than that. Over Europe, it's about two degrees centigrade. But over the Arctic, it's more than three degrees centigrade. So the biggest temperature changes are happening in the Arctic. And what's also happening in the Arctic is you're seeing wildfires, which have never been seen before. But what the wildfires do, of course, they produce soot that falls onto the snow. And therefore, the snow absorbs, uh, reflects even less of the uh, energy that's coming in from the sun. Um, and then a second feedback is, um, is the, uh, the forests of the world. I mean, at the Amazon is a net absorber of CO2 and very large amounts of um, CO2 are absorbed by, uh, by the world's forests. But of course, in some areas of the Amazon now, there's so much drought and destruction of the, of the, of the forest that it's becoming a net emitter of CO2. Uh, and then a third, a third possibility is, of course, methane, uh, which is large quantities of methane are stored in the permafrost in northern latitudes uh, and indeed in the Arctic seabed in very large quantities. And if the war world continues to warm, then that methane will be released and that will add to global warming. So you've got three major positive feedback systems which could kick in any time this century and some already have kicked in. And that is what is driving the urgency about doing something about climate change. Uh, and that's why there is so much concern that there should have been some sort of effective agreement reached at COP26 in Glasgow in, in November of this year. Yeah, and, and let's get into that in the, in the next conversation. But, but as regards to the book, who would you say your ideal readers are? Anyone who's interested in the fate of humankind. Anyone who wants to know why we are in the mess we're in. I mean, it's really an attempt to, I mean, because I've sort of, I've got a scientific background. I've been, I've been sort of very involved in the interface, if you like, between uh, public and environmental issues, public health and environmental issues, and industry. So I've sort of spent 40 years patrolling the interface between people who are trying to improve matters from the environmental or public health point of view with the resistance that you get from the industrial complex. And of course, I tried to patrol that border in order to try and persuade politicians that they ought to come down on the side of public health and the environment rather than believing everything that they get told by industry. So I've had a sort of unique insight, if you like, into the way that the world operates at that level and the way that politicians can or, can or maybe cannot be persuaded uh, to do the right thing. So that's a sort of fairly unusual um, sort of experience to have had. And I felt that with that experience, I could provide some insights into why climate change is such a massively difficult issue. I mean, lead in petrol was simple to solve because once we'd overcome the industrial resistance, from the lead industry, the oil industry, and the car manufacturers. Once we overcome that, it was a relatively simple thing to solve from a technological point of view. 
All they had to do was stop putting the lead in and then find some other way of getting the right octane number. That's all they needed to do. It was very simple. Similarly, with ozone depletion, you know, to solve that, you needed to stop making chemicals that depleted the ozone layer. But it was unfortunate the things they chose happened to be greenhouse gases, but the ozone side of it was relatively simple to solve. But of course, climate change is sort of two or three orders of magnitude more difficult because it impinges on every aspect of our lives because one country doesn't want to do it before another country does it in case they put themselves at an economic disadvantage. So everybody is sort of standing around waiting for someone else to make the first move. Mm. And we've been doing that for 30 years, at least. Mm. And, the, and what do you hope readers will get from, from the book? Well, anyone who wants to get a better understanding of um, what's going to happen in the future. I mean, if you're interested in where human society is going and uh, what sort of dangerous territory it's heading into, then it's all laid out in the book. But what I've also tried to do is give some insight into our psychology. Because, of course, what we believe and what we think isn't necessarily based on rational thought processes. Um, you know, there, Jonathan Haidt has written a wonderful book called The Righteous Mind, where he looks at the way we develop our worldview and our belief systems. And of course, it's very much formulated on what we're told and what we feel as we grow up. It's derived from our, our, our parents, our family, you know, our peers, our teachers. And once we've acquired that worldview, it's very difficult to shift. And even though it's not necessarily rational, it is very difficult to shift it. So when it gets challenged, we don't use our intellect to say, oh, is my worldview wrong? You know, maybe I should look at this fact and maybe I should do this because that's obviously more sensible given what the science is telling us. People don't think like that. What people do is when their worldview is challenged, they instinctively think, how can I re reject this bit of information? So they, we use our intellect to defend our worldview, even though our worldview is wrong and irrational or ideologically based. And that is the problem with climate change. And you see it clearly, you know, in America, where, you know, 40 percent of Americans think that climate change is a hoax that was dreamt up by the Chinese to damage American jobs. Hmm. So and, and looking back over the all the time you've been involved in. Um, in this area, I mean, you've had you've had what success there has been in this space. I think it sounds like you've been involved in it. But how do you keep yourself motivated and, and keep going with with all the bad news? Well, you can't do it continuously. You can only do it in stages. I mean, campaigning is very, very um, <clears throat> it's very demanding. It's very time demanding. It's it it requires a huge amount of mental effort and energy and time. Um, so you sort of have to pace yourself. You have to sort of say, well, I'm going to do this, but not that. You can't do everything. So you have to concentrate on the campaigns where you think the science is so strong that I can surely win this. Do you know what I mean? So I chose air pollution, uh, fracking, and shifting public attitudes to the climate. I never had an ambition to, to solve climate change because that can only be done by international governments. Mm. I mean, if you go to a, uh, you know, if you go to COP26, where these events, uh, where these matters are discussed, you realise how huge the problem is. So you have to choose things where you know the science is rock solid and you use the science to get the change that you want. And it, it's a question of being up to date with all the latest information, writing well-informed letters and articles to national newspapers doing interviews on the occasions that you're asked to, and you contribute to the sort of scientific consensus that is building. And you, you know, you, 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 you can't, no one person can do it on their own, but you can just certainly influence the level of debate and make sure that it's well informed and that people aren't allowed to get away with talking nonsense when it comes to the science, because the science is 
is the basis on which all good campaigns are based. Mm. So what's what's next for you? Are you working on other other books? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I would like uh, what I really want to do now is to sort of I, I feel that the the science of climate change is now established. There's no one really who's disputing it. There are people who are standing in the way of progress, but they're not doing it on the basis of the fact the science isn't reliable. They're now doing it on the basis of uh, we can't afford it or something like that, or yes, we'll do it, but we won't do it till 2060 or 2070. So they're no longer arguing about the science. They're talking about when the remedial measures should happen and how quickly and how extensively. So that is the debate has shifted, as you like. So what I'd like to do now is to, is to sort of do a book where I talk to, you know, the top scientists in the world about who know about climate change and ask them, you know, to give their candid view of what the future holds. Because they don't say it publicly because they are, you know, they are very eminent in their own field and they're very reluctant to make a prediction based on, you know, um, a certain amount has to be based on guesswork. So I, I would like to talk to some of the world's top, top scientists and just get there and compile a book which is based on their views. Right. And, and where can people find out more about you and about the book? Um, well, there... There, there is uh, information on the um, on the publisher's website uh, about the book, and I think there's some I think there's some information about me as well. I'm on Wikipedia. If anyone wants to um, look me up on Wikipedia, and uh, the charity we have your own website, Help Robin. Rescue the Planet, is also on Wikipedia, and so is the Clear Campaign on Wikipedia. So there's three three sources of, uh, if they want uh, further details. Uh, the, the Help Rescue the Planet website um, has a, an archival section with all my publications going back to about 1981, 80, 1980 in the environmental field. Right. Brilliant. So howtorescuetheplanet.org, is that? No, it's hrtp.co.uk. HRTP. Okay. Right. Right. UK. Brilliant. Okay, well, we'll put also, links in the... Um, um, the other thing is that um, in the run up, we, we were talking about, you know, how do you maintain your focus and uh, energy for campaigning? So I sort of decided that this year, 2021, was the year I would make the most effort on climate. So um, apart from, you know, producing the um, new version of my book, The Gilgamesh Gene Revisited, um, I also organised a series of conferences on climate change. So um, uh, I had two, uh, first of all, we started off with two consultations on climate change at Windsor Castle in February and March at St. George's House. Uh, and then I had four climate conferences held in different UK cities every month from May to August. So we did four. We did one in London, Liverpool, um, Edinburgh and uh, Manchester dealing with different aspects of climate change. And they were called May Day C4 conferences. And they have all, all the sort of um, talks that were given, about 60 or 70 talks altogether. Uh, that is all available on another website called MayDayC4.com. So there's the May Day C4 conferences and concerts, incidentally. We organise two concerts as well as four conferences. Right. Um, and then there's the hrtp.co.uk, uh, and then there's I'm, I'm on Wikipedia. So those are the sort of places people can go if they want to find out more. Brilliant. Um, Robin, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome, Jonathan. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for listening to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit our website, www.shepherdwalwin.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are also on the website. And if you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Spotify to give us a review. It's surprisingly helpful in getting the ideas out there. 
So until next time, keep reading. <laughs>